Well, I'm glad everybody could join us. It's exactly five o'clock, and um, this is the uh, Black Knowledge Matters Wednesday. Or, uh, no, you know, my humor. I, there used to be a lady that would come on the radio as, as me and my mother would, uh, and sister would, would be going to church on Sundays, and her name was Teruel Hall Pittman. And she had a show on, on radio station KDIA, and that, and that show was called Negroes in the News. And, 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 and she would say, Negroes in the News. You know, and, and then she would, then she would say all of the things that black people are doing that were positive, you know, and we would hear that on the way to Good Shepherd Church. And so I started to open up with saying, "Welcome to Negroes in the New," but uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm, 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 going, to say, I'm going to say I'm glad that everyone could join us uh, for Black Knowledge Matters Wednesday, and. Uh, we have a special guest today, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Kofi Kandwani. And, uh, you know, when I first met him, he was, uh, he, he was dressed so stunningly, you know, I mean, uh, to a T in, in African uh, attire. And, uh, you know, and then I think the next time I saw him was at the uh, ASCAT conference, the first one. In 1984 at Compton College and after like a, so that was a weekend and it was a Saturday uh, you know we fell in to this person's house I don't I can't remember whose house it was but Dr. Asa Hilliard was there and Kofi was there and I said hey I know that brother and then the next time I saw him uh, I believe it was in 1987 <laughs> actually ended up going to his house um, Kofi's a very special person in the uh, African diaspora, and uh, I thought it would be good for people to know him and to have him on our Wednesday night tonight. And I developed a uh, series of questions that I'm going to uh, uh, ask him. And so I'm going to kind of conduct it in an interview, but you all can ask questions uh, too toward the end, or if there's a pause, uh, and you have a question, uh, feel free to uh, bring it up. But uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to start. I'm going to let uh, Kofi, um, uh, Kofi, would you introduce yourself and, uh, you know, just say a few words about yourself and then I'll start asking the questions. Okay. Greetings, everyone. I'm glad to, to see you all here this evening. And this is a like Imhotep said, and Imhotep's memory is impeccable. I don't remember the stuff he just said. <laughs> I don't remember, but I remember his spirit. And when when I met uh, Imhotep, he had the ugly locks. <laughs> you know, when they was going all every which way. That's that's what I met him. <laughs> So, and, and we've been together ever since then, since brothers, um, as brothers. Um, of course, I changed my name. And when people ask me why I changed my name, I ask them, why did you change my name? Hold it right there. That, that uh, sisters and brothers, is, is what I call coastology. <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> and you know what, Kofi, I use that line when people ask me that. I say, why did you change it? You know, yeah. <laughs> okay, keep going. I'm sorry. But, it, but that tells the importance of a name. And so I knew right away that I was not going to carry a, a white man's slave name anywhere forward in my world with my family. That I knew right away. Um, Names or sounds, sounds are vibrations. Vibrations have effect on the mind and the body and the spirit. They do. And that's why it's so important. When, um, when you are uh, aiming your vibrations towards someone, that they be positive and life-supporting. Um, because that's what we're here to be. We're not here to be a slave, not only with the, the whip, but we're not here to be a slave to money or a slave to food or a slave to anything. 
we have our own entity that we have dominion over. And that's why the name was important and that's why I changed it. They ask me what it used to be, I tell them nothing. <laughs> uh, it's not, nobody's business. That person has retired. So I move forward with an African name. Give thanks, give thanks. So Kofi is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Community Health and Preventative Medicine and Family Medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And he chairs the Global Health Task Force, uh, instructs uh, the facility in, in the de facility development program and is the course director for the introduction to complementary and alternative medicine and cross-cultural communications in health courses. So uh, just want to give you that little background. Of course, uh, our discussion won't be limited to that. So I'm going to start um, at the beginning or uh, somewhere thereabouts. So Brother Kofi, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. Um, I have um, nine brothers and sisters. One is transition. Um, lived in the projects. And I mean, we really lived in the projects. When, when we went there, they were new. When we left, they were tore up. <laughs> <laughs> when when um, we actually moved from, we moved three times within the projects. That'll let you know <laughs> how long we stayed there. Uh, and one of the last time, we moved next door. And everybody had furniture on the top of their head and carrying like this out of one project in, right into the next. So that's been my life. Um, elementary school, uh, high school, all was kind of normal. All right. So, so now, where now, where are you from? Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio. All right. All right. And you and you had nine siblings. I didn't, no. but my mama died then. Yeah, your, your mom, mom, your mom, mom and dad. <laughs> your mom and dad. <laughs> okay. See, that's what I mean. Coftology. Um, so how did you get started in martial arts? I know that you're, you're in martial arts. How, how, did, how did that come about? Well, I, I've always been kind of going in the opposite directions a lot of the time. People go this way, I go that way. But um, I figured if I got into some trouble and had to protect my life, I couldn't basketball nobody to death. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't tell somebody to get off of me. I had to learn how to fight. <laughs> and and so I did that here in, well, there in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and then later on, I studied for two and a half years in Korea, in Seoul, Korea, uh, with a eighth degree black belt. And I got my second before I left uh, Korea. Now, what's the, what's the form? Again, what's that? It's called hop keto. Hop keto. Hop keto. Hop is is um, a mixture. Key represents the key to the universe, and do is the way. But it's one of those styles that you didn't. He wouldn't let us practice with um, uh, any kind of swords or anything like that. He says, if you're walking down the street with a sword, ain't nobody gonna bother you. So <laughs> you can figure that one out. But he taught us how to use keys and glasses and and just the things that are around you um, when something crazy uh, might happen. And he always said, you never uh, you you never tell somebody you're getting ready to kick their butt. You either do it or you leave. <laughs> you don't announce it across the room and go running over there. He might be a little better than you. <laughs> all right, all right. So now. Uh, you know, I know that you're heavily into meditation. How did you get involved with meditation? By meditating. And in one meditation, <laughs> <laughs> in one uh, particular meditation in Korea, I was sitting outside meditating 
didn't know really how to do it or what I was doing, but I knew I needed to get my physical body still so I could handle that. And then my mind started to settle down and I actually, first I began to, to see items from inside out and outside in at the same time which meant that there was a, a very thin veil between what is out here and what is within. It's all the same. And even that it was like a bubble, but even the bubble wasn't real, but it, it was only there to help you see all of this other infinite around you, unbounded. That, so that was the first experience. And within the same meditation, I literally um, was, I would say, told or informed. Uh, it, there was no question about it, but that this is what I would be doing my life. This is what my life is to do. And so I've been doing it ever since. So just just sitting in, there in Korea, were you were you like in a in a serene place or? I was no, I was sitting outside the the barracks. Mm. And so people going in and out, the street was, you know, right there in front of me. So it, it was peaceful, but it was still people going back and forth. All right. Wow. You know, I never knew that. As long as, long as I've known you, I've never known that. Anybody want to wanna ask, ask the Dr. Kandwani, Dr. Kofi, a question? You guys want to? All right. Doris. Can you tell us a little bit about your military question. service? <laughs> Okay, go just ahead. Oh. Unmuted. Go ahead, Debbie. Yeah, she asked about my up? military service. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I joined the Army at 17 um, because I had graduated high school uh, a year early. So I only did three years of high school. And I really didn't have nothing else planned. You know, so uh, a friend of mine had already gone in first and so I followed him, but I signed up to be guaranteed to go to Korea. So they couldn't send me to Vietnam or send me to any other place. That was part of the agreement. And they sent me to Korea, and then I stayed in Korea my whole time, and then I got out after that. My uh, specialty first was uh, management, and then I switched over to, to medical. But even when I was in management, I was supposed to manage a company of 200 people, but there were only 17 in the company that I was in. Mm. So the work you would do for a whole day, I finished in about a half hour and was free for the rest of the day. That's why I stayed there. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, there was someone else that uh, voice uh, uh, came up. Was there someone else that wanted to ask the question? Yeah, it was me, uh, Mama Afua. Mama Afua. And yes, I want to say a special hello to Brother Kofi because I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. All right. It's about a 40 minute drive from Dayton, Ohio. Yep, yep. Well, thank and you. And somehow I got involved and very much interested in holistic health or, and traditional medicine. I even went to a couple of classes, you know, in, um, in the motherland, in Ghana. And um, so how did you become involved to the point where you're now teaching traditional medicine? And I say traditional rather than holistic. Yeah. Um, I, I, I figured out <clears throat> early on that meditation was traditional medicine. Yes. I'm not a healer. You do your own healing. So my role is to help people set up the conditions to heal themselves. Mm. And then I'm done. My job is finished. And, and I think almost most importantly, is that I can do an, inf an infinite number of people at the same time. Mm. Because uh, I've taught for instance, 250 people on Zoom a, about a week or so ago, meditation mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, about 30 uh, first year medical students and this was on Zoom. So they're all at home in their favorite spot. 
but all of them was able to sit down, settle down wherever they were and be still and meditate. And I did a, a, a questionnaire afterwards, you know, a polling thing, asking mm -hmm. how many of them, uh, how many of the people there felt their breath slow down. 100% of the people pointed to that. So all of these different places, and it's the most simplest technology that exists because you do nothing. You do less and less until you're not doing anything. So now there's other, um, there's the ability for the body to then move more toward healing than toward sustaining anxiety, depression, and all of this kind of stuff. Right. Oh, so now this question, so I, I sent Kofi uh, uh, some of these questions, um, you know, just to kind of uh, get him, give him a feel of wh where I was going with, with this, this class. And, and Doris had this question. And she said, how did you get your African-centered views and how were they developed? Because hmm. for her, this pulls everything together in your, you, you know, your life, you know, your, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing, your travels to Africa, meditation, Black Family Day, etc. So can you answer that question? Hmm. I think... For me, the first thing um, was growing up black in the ghetto and seeing on TV, leave, leave it to Beaver and uh, Wally and them having all everything they want and this thing and that thing. So they got all this money. We don't have anything. And they expect us to live our life like that in, in peace and harmony. Uh, I think the first time it really hit me what was going on around us was when I was walking with my mother downtown uh, in Homer, Louisiana. That's where our grandparents are, used to live. And um, we're walking, she's holding my hand, and I stopped. This is one of these towns where the courthouse is in the middle of the, the town and the police station and all, everything's right there in the center with a piggly wiggly. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we're walking and I see this laundromat and I saw a sign that said white only. And I'm still walking with her. And I said, mama, what kind of wash machines can only wash white clothes? <laughs> Ophthalmology. Yep. And she said, they're not talking about clothes. Come on in, boy. You know, took me out of there. But then when I figured out what, what it was, that there was, it was a white only sign for the laundromat, I wanted to go by and, and, and break the window before I left, left the town. You know, but I didn't that time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I, I got my ideas that things were wrong. And then I began to read and study and um, meet high level folks. And that happened so often in my life. It, it cannot be by accident. Um, they were attracted to me as much as I was attracted to them. And so we were able to, um, to interact and um, just converse as, as people really in the struggle. All right. Well, that's, you know, again, I'm, I, as long as I've known you, I, 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 you know, these are, these are stories that uh, I've never heard before. I give thanks for that. So now. I hope you're recording because I'll forget it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're recording. <laughs> uh, so um, now you were involved with Black Family Day in a big way. And, um, you know, you saw it. I, I, I want to say from the beginning and as it grew and expanded. So can you talk about, you know, your role in organizing UC Davis Black Family Day? Okay, well, um, Black Family Day was a time that Black students, now there were, at the time I was there, there was about 19, 20,000 white folks 
and less than a thousand black folks. And um, I, you know, the black faculty and staff got together and actually started before me and it developed each year. And then when I got there, I, I became the chair and um, it grew. It got huge. We were having 50,000 people on campus um, with a bunch of different things to do. I mean, it wasn't like we were bringing them there to, to just hang out. We had three stages of music. We had a basketball tournament going on. We had um, uh, ex uh, exhibits, you know, on, on White Family Day. They get all this money and that's been going on for a long time. And then when we have ours, they all disappear. And what, we're trying to uh, hold the thing, you know, up. So um, we got on their case and eventually we got started to get money. We started to get exhibits. Uh, Davis has a, um, all kinds of wildlife and fisheries biology and atmospheric science and agronomy and palmology and all of these things that we hardly ever heard of. How are we gonna pick it up as a, as a, how are we gonna choose it as our career if we never heard of it? Yeah, yeah. And these are the things that they've been doing to us for so long, so long. So we did Black Family Week. Of course, all the white folks would leave town when we had it. Um, and I actually got bribed or tried to get bribed by the police chief of the university. He was going to give me $10,000 just to cancel the event. I don't know wow. how you cancel it. I don't know why you cancel it. I don't care what the re reason is. You cancel it, you got 10 grand from me. Wow. He said, because it's going to cost me 60 grand for security. Kofi, I didn't know that. I was there with you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Amhotep. How are you doing? Hi. Who's, who's that? Nadine. Hey, Nadine. <laughs> <laughs> Long time. Uh, Kofi, yeah. I'm sorry for breaking in on your talk, but that's crazy. I did. Did you ever tell me that? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I, I didn't say much of it, but yeah. Carry on. That, sorry. That, that was like doing. Nadine was a student at UC Davis when I was there. Um, you might remember her in her tip. She oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I know Nadine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, keep going. I haven't seen you. I, when I saw the white hair, I didn't recognize you. Keep going, man. Okay, what's the question? So are, are, are you still talking about Black Family Day? Oh, yes. So anyway, they um, they came up with their own scheme, probably gave somebody a, 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 a vial of crack coach cane or something and had them come on the campus during right in the middle of everything and all these people start shooting, firing shots in the air. Everybody scattered. You, you know, we know how to run and, and stuff like that happens. And of course that got in the newspaper and the Wall Street Journal and the this and the that and, you know, about that. And of course, then the university had an excuse now to taper things back. Don't invite nobody from the Bay Area. You can only invite your parents and then, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I think it's still alive, but I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I, I was there that day. That day, uh, Wose was doing a fundraiser and we were feeding the crew, the Ma'at Patrol. You, you created the Ma'at Patrol. And I think yeah. Nadine was part of that Ma'at Patrol. And, uh, you know, we, we did all this barbecue. We had this, like, I don't know, it must have been like, it, it, was, it was a barbecue pit that had to have been like, I don't know, 20 It was feet. huge. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, and, and we, we, you know, we bought like all this chicken and we, you know, and we, and we were cooking and, 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 and you know, we, we made, uh, we made a nice piece of change that day. But I remember right toward the end, people just started running. And, uh, and I, I remember that day, that was, that was awful. It was the biggest the year. Excuse me? It was the biggest year. We had the biggest population there. And that was the year that the police had like directed everybody right onto the highway. As right. soon as you came off campus, you couldn't go anywhere but the highway. Back Even on. people you that lived there. Go back on. That was so mm -hmm. cold. But and the cars were backed up all the way back to Oakland. Yep. <laughs> you know, Almost. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely sack. Anyway, I mean, that was such a meaningful event, Black Family Day. You you looked forward to mm -hmm. it. Uh, I, I remember Dick Gregory being there. I remember you having a, a stomp show. I remember, uh, you know, the bands. Um, uh, we'll say Stones of Fire sang, sang there one year. And, mm -hmm. and it was such a great event. So now my you helped my father out. My father was, uh, I remember, uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, uh, it was on Father's Day. My father came in, and uh, he he of course remembers you. And and believe it or not, he asks about you sometimes. He says, mm. he says, How, how's Kofi? So, um, what were you doing at the West Oakland Health Center? Um, West Oakland is an interesting area. It's kind of a tough area, I would say. Um, and I was involved in a study there and it's a published study looking at the effects of meditation on blood pressure in african americans uh that were 55 years or older and i thought they were old at that time i'm saying god these people is old you know and now i are one <laughs> oh, but <laughs> so um uh, they randomized people to learn meditation and Fortunately, your father got randomized to my group. He could have been in the other group, uh, which was health education. And then there was a third group on um, progressive muscle relaxation. But he got the group that I was teaching. And so they taught, I taught meditation to that group. Someone else taught the health, uh, health education and someone else taught the um, progressive muscle relaxation. And then we looked at their blood pressure before they learned and then three months after. And in that study, um, the meditation group dropped about 12 systolic, which is the top number, and about six diastolic um, within that three month period. And the progressive muscle relaxation group was about half of that. And then the health ed actually had a slight increase. So that went on for a couple of years because we had about 40 people in each group. But I remember one time um, when I was there, the lights went out. And um, they, had, they had the dentistry there. They had to cut all the dentistry stuff and put everything away. They were closing. They had this one closing, this one closing, this one closing. Everything, everything closed, no electricity. And one of the guys that was in the study had a Lincoln Continental. And there was about six people or seven people in the group. We got in that big ass Lincoln and we, we did our meditation and went on about our business. And I laughed at these other guys talking about you, you can't do nothing without some electricity. And the main thing I do has nothing to do with electricity. No batteries, no nothing, just is. Right. So um, we, we can go on. I don't, I don't... No, it's, uh, so uh, I, I know you work with Dr. S uh, Barbara Staggers. Oh, no, Frank Staggers, right? Uh, her father? Yeah, both, both of them. Both of them. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara Staggers was in the um, the children's hospital. She was an uh, adolescent physician, and um, her brother, these were sister and brother. Uh, he was in that Oakland study, and he also was uh, managing some uh, methadone clinics and some other stuff in San Francisco. Any other, any, anyone else have, a, have another question for Dr. Kandwani, Dr. Kofi? I, I have a question for the doctor. Yes, yes sir. Uh, good evening, doctor. This is uh, Malik Kafile. Thank Hello. you for joining us on Black Knowledge Matters. Uh, my question is pertaining to um, the origins of meditation, mm -hmm. because oftentimes it's associated with either Hindu or India or even Asian cultures. And I know that not to be true. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to uh, the origins of meditation? And is it related to uh, in any way medu, uh, netter, or uh, medicine? That's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I like those kind of questions. Um, let me first say um, that when we talk about Black Lives Matter, 
we're still on the surface of life. And life is not judged by who matters to who. The deeper you get within yourself, the darker you're going to be. Until you have no thoughts at all. And there you are with infinite black being. That's where our black lives started. So nobody owns that. Nobody owns silence, nor do they own how you get there. There are ways that are faster than others. You can go on a bike, you can fly, you can walk. So that may have, um, may help you prioritize which are the ones that are going to be more useful to you. Um, So nobody owns it. A lot of people have a lot of tricks and stuff that you have to go through to get to it. But it's sitting not in front of your nose, it's sitting behind your nose. So um, nobody can claim that. It just is. But meditation can get you there. You can call it what you want. If the Wright brothers were Catholic, does that mean only Catholics can ride the plane? So no matter where it came from, if it takes you to that peace and that calmness and that quietness within you, use it. Want to get you there faster? Problem getting onto the meeting? Yes. And, and yes, um, uh, Brother, meditation was around at the beginning of thought. And you know who was around that thought. And we've had it and we've nursed it and we <laughs> we built life out of it. And we did that for thousands of years before these boys got on here, before these affirmative action students came to town. So, um, I don't know. Any other part of that you want, you want me to focus on? You are mute. Um, you are mute, Imhotep. Thank You're you, mute. Malik. Thank you, Malik, for that question. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I've been trying to take care of some business uh, behind the scenes, and uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a friend of ours has just joined us. I think Mama Darnisha has uh, facilitated that, uh, and and I'm sure he'll speak up a little later. Now, uh, one time when you were visiting us, uh, the Alcabalans, when we lived over on uh, Dayburst, uh, you were going to India, and uh, you were going to spend like a month or so. And we said, well, if you're going to India, you got to go see Sa Sai Baba, and uh, you know, I don't think you were really that excited to do that uh, then, but you, but you agreed uh, to uh, to do that. You kind of humored us, and uh, and 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 you had some really interesting experiences. Can you uh, can you share uh, that story with us? Sure. Um, I didn't know who Sai Baba was. Period. I had not heard of him. I'd not seen a picture of him. Read nothing about him, and then Hotep talking about go see this person. So um, I, I went to India with a family um, that was Indian, and uh, my friend Dean, his father was a priest, and over there there's no separation between church and state, um, and this priest was responsible for 300 temples. Uh, that includes celebrations and, you know, weddings and all of that kind of stuff. And he was also a playwright. But he knew Sai Baba. And so what happened was he, he um, asked me, what did I want to do while I was in India? And the only thing that I knew <laughs> to do was to say what he told me to say. It was to see Sai Baba. So he says, okay. 
Then he got 10 priests and lined them up in front of me. And he said, which one do you want to take you to see Sai Baba? And I, I chose one of the priests and he said, good, good. And I said, why are you saying good? He said, because he had been in a car accident and um, he's healed, but his parents haven't seen him since then. And they live in the same place we were going. So he was very happy about that. So um, we went there, we had to catch a train. Two days we were on the train um, in these three, three, bunk, three bed um, cabins, no six actually. And um, I got uh, there to Bangalore and I um, got a hotel there. And then there's two places that Sai Baba goes. He's either there near that city White Plains, or he's far away at his birthplace, which is about a three hour, four hour ride. So I said that I would ride in the morning and that person would be able to go home and you know be with his family and I'd go to see Sai Baba. So I hired a car before I went to sleep, come and get me at three o'clock in the morning. We drove and uh, he drove and got there just in time for the meditation. And he, my car was parked right at the gate where he dropped me off. So I go in and we sit near, we sit at this ashram, take our shoes off, and then we went inside a uh, very tight um, for meditation. We did the meditation. When I came out of the meditation, a friend of mine was there that I hadn't seen in years, didn't know he was there. He didn't know I was coming. Our shoes were right next to each other. So he says, man, if you're going to see Sai Baba, you know, you, um, you got to go over there. You got to sit in line with all the men. And then one line goes in at a time. I said, okay. So we went over, picked the line, sit in that line. We were in the back of the line. And um, they called our line first. What they did was they put a number in that uh, little bag for every, every row, which was about 20, 30 rows. And um, whatever number you had, that's the number that you were going. That would stop all of the flooding and pushing and all of that kind of stuff. So we got in, we sit down, and my friend says, Kofi, if Sai Baba asks you how many are with you, you say two. <laughs> Instead of just me, he wanted me to say how many. I said, okay, that's so, right. Kofi, Kofi, can, can, can you stop right there? You know, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't ask that question right, and, and I should have I should have given more introductions. So, Satya Sai Baba uh, is is a famous uh, Indian guru, and many people think that uh, he is an avatar or descended into flesh. A lot of miraculous things uh, happen around him: his birth, his life. We don't have time to go into that, but so that that is who uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kofi is, is going to visit. Okay, I'm sorry, Kofi, go ahead. Okay, thank you. You should have told me that when I was going the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, we, we meditate as a group. We go and we sit down. There's probably 5,000 people there, men on one side, women on the other side, a group of his disciples and a group of elders and cripples. Those, and we came in in different orders and the men were the last one to come in. So after my friend said, if he asks you, tell him to. Uh, we waited a few more minutes and Baba comes out. And the first time I see him, they had sitar music playing and he's just walking around. People are kissing his feet and touching his robe. And um, he was over on the women's side and he stopped and he walked over to the men's side. And I saw one, one white guy get on, he, he was on his knee, he was sitting already. And he was just begging like that, begging like that. And, and uh, 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 Baba just, you know, said, kind of set him back down. But I knew later he was giving him permission that he was going to see him. And uh, he, he kept walking down and he looked down at me when it got to me, people were giving him letters and you know all kinds of stuff. Um, he looked at me and says, um, where are you from? I said, the US. 
He says, how many are with you? I said, two. He says, you come. And he did like that. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> come, come where, come who, you know, I just didn't know. But my friend got up and left me because he knew what to do. <laughs> so uh, the man, the, um, I guess the security or something assistant was behind him. He, he again um, asked me to um, come, come. So I got up and, and he took me over uh, uh, to a little small kind of room, but still outside. The man that was begging, basically he brought 10, uh, I think it was 10 people. Yeah, 10 people he had with him, plus me and my friend. That was it out of all those people. So we came in and we sat down, the men on one side, women on the other side. And as he comes in the door, well, the first thing I saw that was when I asked about my friend Imhotep <laughs> in my mind, I said, what has he done? Because I saw Baba flame his, do his hand like that and candy fell out of the sky over these women and they were taking it and, and picking it up and, you know, have it. So they, they're gone. And that's the first thing I saw that was out of kilter, let's say. <laughs> so then we go inside and we sit down. And as he comes in, he starts to produce ash, the booty. And he did that and the ash was flowing out of his hands. Now I'm sitting on the floor looking up. His sleeve was you know, like about here. So it wasn't no sleeve thing under the sleeve. And then when he finished, his hand was clean and clear, no drop of nothing on it. And then he sat down in, in his obvious chair uh, with a um, throne, uh, little pillow so his feet would touch the ground because it, it was too small to touch the ground. Um, and he started talking. He says, um, I used to just want to worship God. And I worship God and I worship God. And then I discovered that God was my father. And I continued to worship him, but not as this entity out in the sky, but as my father. And he said, I continued to worship him. I continued to worship him. And then I discovered that I was God. And he said, the only difference between me and you is that I know it and you don't. So then they start talking some more about, you can meditate anytime. You can breathe in, soul, breathe out, hum, soul, hum. I am God, God I am. Just tell yourself that. And um, he looked at one of the Italians, actually the same guy that was begging and translating uh, into Italian. He says, you have a, um, a um, what do you call it? Um, uh, something in his eye. He said, like a bacteria, virus, something in his eye. And the guy said, oh, no, no, I think it's just a sand. And he says, no. He says, you take this. And he did his hand palm down, made it palm up. And there was an egg-shaped stone with swirls of black and white and brown and tan on this. He says, you take this and you put it in a glass and you put water in that glass and you take that water and you put it on your eye. He says, it will cure that disease and it will cure other diseases as well. So now I'm really, you know, saying, oh, this is, you know, I'm feeling much, much better. And he looked at me and he says, um, you go today? I says, yes, Sai Baba, I came today and I go today. He says, you come. Took me into another room, shut the curtains, start looking at me, looking me over. He says, um, uh, what did he say first? He says, um, not where are you from? What did he ask me? He said, um, Something about you and Impingo, wasn't it? Uh... Yeah, that was one of them. I don't know if that was first, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, he, um, but he wanted to know what I do and, and all of that. And I told him that I taught meditation. He says, meditation? What is meditation? What is meditation? I said, it's when you slow your mind down. He said, you don't have to slow down to meditate. You can meditate while you're walking. You can meditate while... Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Bob. He says, your mind is like a monkey. It jumps from one thing to the other. And I said, yes, I'm aware of some issues around that. <laughs> And then he asked me, um, your wife, where's your, where's your wife? And I said, the U.S. He said, you two are like this, and that's not good. And one of the reasons I went to India was to make that decision. So then um, he says, um, okay, I will bless you. And he turned again, his hand palm down and then he turned it up, nothing in his hand. And then he and I looked again, and there was oil seeping out of his skin and forming little pools between his fingers, all running down to a pool in the palm of his hand. And he said, take off your shirt, or unbutton your shirt. I unbuttoned my shirt. He says, um, unbuckle your pants, or unbuckle my pants. And he rubbed the oil just beneath my navel, just beneath my navel. And he says, I will bless you. And he kind of waved backwards like that. And he, he did invite me to stay, but I, that was, you know, I could, my plans wouldn't let me do that. But um, that was my Sai Baba experience. So when you got home, I remember that helped you because you passed some, you Remember? Yeah, you man, you got a memory. You should be telling these stories, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, two or three days after I got back, uh, Baba had touched me on both my um, kidneys. And two or three days after I got back, I got sick as a dog, I left a meeting, drove myself to the hospital, and I passed a, a kidney stone. Didn't know I had it. There was nothing. But I'm glad he set it up for me to wait till I got home and I didn't go to have to go to a doctor in India. Yeah, that's so, for sure. That's, for that's sure. another another story, yes. Now, those, now these are great stories because you seem to have like a, a miraculous life. Things things happen to you that, that, that the average person it doesn't happen to. So uh, now you're in Nigeria. But, but I, wait a minute, I, I kind of okay. disagree with that because okay. all of these things happen to everybody. You know, it, there may be different levels of it, but it's all part of the, 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 the mix. So whatever it is that we're here doing, you know, that's what we're here to do. And that's what we should do. Um, I didn't plan none of this. I didn't plan my life to be a, a professor at, at a medical school. But it what, happened. What, what about your wife? What happened with that relationship when you returned? Um, I'm sorry I didn't end that story, but um, we're still friends. Okay. We've been friends all of these years since then. Yeah, so uh, now you go to Nigeria and, uh, you know, probably at that time, one of the, uh, other than Bob Marley, uh, one of the most famous international musicians is Fela. And could you talk about that story? Yes. Let me start out by saying, he invited me to his funeral. Fela invited you to his funeral? Yes. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I'm going I'm to I'm expand on it a, a bit. Uh -huh. But I want you to think about it early. Because um, I'm there with Heru, my son, and he was about four or five years old, and um, my second wife. Um, and we're still friends. But um, she, um, so we're sitting there watching TV and we see that on the news that Fela had died. And he had been sick, so it's kind of people waiting and everything. So I went outside to pour libation by myself. So I prepared myself, poured about two pours of the libation, and then it felt like whole earth underneath me started shaking. And I heard his voice. 
that said that you honored me in this way, you come to my home going. That's what he said. Mm. So, you know, it was a few days later, so I'm scurrying around. We're about two and a half hours away from uh, Lagos. We were down in Benin City. Uh, but I got somebody who agreed to go with me, um, went there, went to his house, thousands of people all around the house, thousands of people, pushing at the gate, trying to get in. This is family. This is, this is where he was buried. And um, Femi, his son, who had his son on his shoulder, walked down the steps at his house, walked to the gate, looked at me, and said, come on in. Mm. So my friend and I was there until we was ready to leave. So had I not felt that feeling or poured that libation, I would not have been there to spend time with his family. Wow. Wow. Now, just one more before uh, we take some more questions. Just one more story that I think is <laughs> is, is interesting. So you you are you left with a group, uh, and you guys went to Cuba, and uh, so could you talk about the group and uh, uh, who you saw when you were in Cuba? Okay. So far, you're doing good. You haven't asked me any time questions. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me what it happened. I just know it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was a um, an organization that still exists um, that takes people to Cuba on educational tours. That's all, you know, you couldn't just go there to go there. You had to be on a program with an agenda, with somebody watching you all while you were there and um, you do what you do and then you, you leave. That's, that was the protocol. So um, this was, I think it was a research thing on um, complementary and alternative medicine. And I wanna add a little story to that when I finish this. But um, so it was about 10 of us from different places, different universities and a few other places, hospitals. And um, we are having dinner. First, we're having dinner in the government house. And, um, you know, them fancy kind of dinners where you see your, your name on a map of the table and then you go find where you're supposed to sit, that kind of uh, dinner. And then the Minister of Health said, uh, no matter where you are, um, when we have to leave, the Commandant wants to see us. And, um, we're going to leave and go. So everybody's eating fast, trying to, you know, get their food in together. And this was about nine o'clock at night. So we go into a waiting room and we didn't wait long, five minutes. And here comes Fidel Castro wow. in his green army uniform and uh, black gym shoes. Um, he had a translator and he was talking to us. You know, we had, there were doctors there. There was this, you know, different kind of people. Um, so we went into his boardroom and the boardroom had, was a big, probably would hold 30 people, you know, look like the same one in the White House. In fact, it's a bigger one than the White House one. And um, he just started talking. He talked about stuff all, all night long. We were with him for about nine hours straight. Um, he had dinner while we were there and he shared his dinner with all of us. He had um, um, some kind of, it was like a oatmeal-ish kind of thing because his uh, intestines was, was what everybody was worried about, you know, uh, killing him basically. And he was talking about the doctors that they were scared to touch him. <laughs> you know? But um, uh, so we, we, we went in, we sat down and we had this nine hour conversation he talked about all kinds of stuff about feeding, you know, you know, thousands and thousands of people and how much, how many tons of rice you need to do that and because they feed their people. So people can get food for free. People can go to healthcare for free. They can um, have a place to live for free. 
they can be educated for free. That's what he built over there, even with all of the, the stuff that we tried to do to him. He outlived uh, eight U.S. presidents. Eight. And I'm, I was hoping that he would, you know, leave while Obama was still president and not under 45, but uh, he left during uh, 45's administration. But one of the things that um, he did was he says, war is not the same as it used to be, and it'll never be the same. He says, let me, let me show you. He asked his people, what time is it in East Timor? I didn't even know where East Timor was. My sense what time it was. And he um, had him call his captain over there. They were providing med medical um, services for both sides of the fight. And he wanted to know who on this side got killed, how many got killed, how did they get killed, you know, um, asking those kinds. Of, Do you need anything? The guy says, no, there's nothing that we need. What about uh, dialysis, mach dialysis machines? Do you have a dialysis machine? No, I don't. Well, you need a dialysis machine. So we're sending you two, and they're going to be there next week. So he, then he, he just you know, kept going off about electricity and you know, how much it's taken, how long do you have to boil water in, in order for things to be purified and uh, reserving energy, that kind of stuff. And one time, I was the only one he spoke to in English. And um, I had started asking him a question, and I don't even remember what the question was. And he started answering it, and then he went off on some topic and stayed off on that top topic for about 45 minutes. And then he came back to me. He said, what was that question again? <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, I don't remember what it is, but whatever it is, is not as important as what you're saying right now. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he pulled his beard like that, and he says, I agree. <laughs> uh, Kofi, when you were there, I remember you talking about the magnets that were left. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you share some light on that? Yeah, that was the side story that I wanted to, ah, to, to say. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at the ways they use complementary and alternative medicine or traditional medicine or um, folklore medicine, whatever you want to call it. But um, so we were touring this place and there was a guy sitting down in a chair and he had two feet of a magnet on both of his feet or under his both feet and the magnet um, on his hands. And he was just sitting there. And so um, I, of course I said, I want to try it. You know, it's just a magnet. So there was another setup just like that next to him. And so I, put my feet on the magnets, and the magnets had a curvedness to it, like a donut, but it was a big one, but it was like a donut. And then I sit there, and then the man next to me spoke. I don't know what he said, but the words that came out of his mouth went through my whole body, riding those waves from that magnet. I could feel it. Come in, go out, come back in and go out. So I knew there was some, some energy there and some wavelengths and some, some movement, some, some, something going on. So I asked the guy, um, why was he there taking that therapy? And he said, because he, he has two fingers missing, two fingers got cut off, and he has pain where the fingers used to be. And so he would get into this magnetic field and that would relieve the pain of his phantom pain. Mm. But, and, and that was amazing. But even more interesting was that those round pieces of magnet could be put back together back into a, a, a ring about this long. Like, like the hole was probably this big. And then there was a magnet probably about another uh, six inches away. So a big thing. But those magnets actually came from the Cuban Missile Crisis. So when um, they were fighting to make uh, Fidel um, uh, not allow Russian missiles on, 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 the, on the island, 
and uh, they had already had some there. That's what the whole fight was about. They had some already there. And so they had to dismantle those, and they took those magnets from the missile and used them for help. Wow. Wow. Now, I, 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 I thank you for sharing these stories. Um, I think that uh, Abuya is on this call. <laughs> uh, Abuya, are you, are you uh, on this call? Uh, you might want to unmute yourself if you're muted. Well, well, maybe he's not. I thought I thought Abuya was was with us. Oh, there you go. Want to say something, uh, Doctor Mack? I'm just listening. I'm, I'm yeah. just, feel great to see Kofi again, <laughs> alive in person. Yeah, it's good to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> you looking good, good sir. Dr. Mack, this, uh, Dr. Mack was a faculty at, at uh, UC Davis when I was a student there. And he changed my life. He said to a class that we were in, he says, if anybody wants to learn Tai Chi, you're welcome. And it won't cost you anything other than being there at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 and I was the only one out of the class that came. Right. And then he's, you know, that's when I really started to learn um, Tai Chi, you know, frontwards and backwards and, and all that stuff. And, and I still yeah. do it today. That's some good times. Yeah. Yep. And it was, uh, he, he also supported me in a, my first semester, I think, or maybe the second at UC Davis as a student. Um, I had to do a paper in all three of my classes and so i did the paper on brain hemispheric differences between black and white so by the time i was done with that i had an experiment set up with the machine i had uh, a sociology class i was taking and i had dr max class as well so i was able to combine all three and do one paper submitted it to each one saying that, you know, I don't believe in duplication of effort. <laughs> Good paper, too. Well, thank right. you. Now, now, that kind of leads me into uh, this next question. So, um, you're a graduate of MIU, uh, a doctorate program. So, could you, could you just tell us what that is and, you know, your daily routine and the experiences while you're on the campus, where it is, et cetera. Okay. Um, Maharishi is the founder of Transcendental Meditation, TM. And you may have heard of that. The Beatles and Merv Griffin and you know, all these boogie stars and stuff was, was into that meditation. Um, uh, so when I was in Korea, one of the things that I did was I learned TM and I, practiced it for quite a while while I was over there. And then I got a hold of a catalog and decided that I want to go there. So I went to visit with my brother, or two brothers, and you know, it was they had just moved to that location in Iowa, Fairfield, Iowa, about an hour from Iowa City. And then um, um I decided that I was gonna come. No black folks, you know, didn't 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 see Mary. And um but I wanted to come. One of the things later on that I, I told um, the assembly of everybody basically on the campus, I said, what you are doing here closely matches what we did in ancient Egypt. How, because they interweave, they interwove meditation throughout the educational process. And they included natural rhythms like rest and activity. So we would have two months of academic work, and then we would have a month of nothing, nothing but resting, relaxing, meditating, eating, staying on the low key for a month. And then you become, you become active again. And so that was the way the school came. So we do two months of activity, a month of rest, another two months of studies, another month of rest. So. And when it started, they started talking about what I mentioned earlier about 
consciousness becoming conscious of itself as the beginning of everything else. The first consciousness had to be conscious of its own existence. And so the, the next class after those short classes, we start looking at Big Bang theories and we start looking at stellar evolution. And then we looked at earth science and then we looked at um, biology and, and you know animal science and on into humans and on into the humanities and people. So there was a natural progression in, in the um, curriculum. And I like that because you take these things disjointedly and you don't see how they come together. You, you, it, it's hard to re-put this stuff in, in order. So we were, it was taught to us in order. So that's where I got my bachelor's degree. I, I left UC Davis, finished my bachelor's there. I got my master's and PhD from there uh, with a, a scholarship from the National Institute of Health. Um, then I did my postdoc in Nigeria where um, I had, was there for about a year. Then I was down here at UC Davis, I mean at Morehouse School of Medicine since then for about 20 something years. Mute, you're on mute. Houseman. <laughs> oh, wow, sorry about that. Any, anybody wanna ask any questions? Are you clowning me, uh, Abuya? <laughs> <Is that what? laughs> oh, no, I was just commenting uh Kofi is a houseman, Morehouse. Ah. Very, very um important campus, uh, not often uh, celebrated for the men who are graduates of that college. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate that my son is a graduate of Morehouse. And uh, wonderful. He picked the right one. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, if I may ask a question. Um, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kofi. Um, I'm just interested in your thoughts, your take on this particular, you know, perspective. So, you know, in India, they have such deep spiritual wisdom and knowledge and tradition. But however, you know, and it may be related to the principle of polarity, but yet, you know, they also have the caste system. And so it kind of amazes me sometimes when I look at such heights and such depths. And I just wanted you to maybe if you could share a little bit of what would you what would be your your you know your perspective on that or you know how you could you know can you shed a little light in, in, in helping me to kind of contextualize you know these two polarities? Well, um, I, I think the answer is in your question. Almost because it is a polarity, and and we have those same kind of polarities. I mean, if 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 they're polar opposites, they're related. And mm -hmm. you know, you you go, you go on one side, you go deep, and you miss this whole other aspect of the polarity, and you you know you don't have the whole thing. I I think that they have been less less raped than we were. So some of their things remained intact. Whereas they thoroughly did a job on us. I mean, thoroughly. And, and they continue to. And, but we have those same polarities, I think. We have high men. You know, I was thinking about John Lewis um, today because he's here in Atlanta. Um, but what if he didn't have to fight racism and white supremacy? What could he have been, you know? What, what could Malcolm X have been if he, if he chose his own profession? Um, like uh, I saw they were looking at Regis Phyllis or whatever his name is that, you know, they were so sad about it, but he got a choice. He got to walk on the TV and be accepted and appreciated, spend his life doing all that, and he's a big hero. Um, but I think that, that we have this, a similar kind of polarity, that we have our saints, and we have our philosophies, but most of it has been taken from us, and uh, and we just don't remember. Yeah, I, I 
I, I often think that was uh, Minister Ahmadi that asked that question. Yes. You know, I, I, I often think about uh, that as well. And as, mm -hmm. as Kofi had, had mentioned, a lot of things were left intact, their spirituality, their spiritual systems. But you have to realize that India had been on, in invasion for like 1,500 years straight. So people coming from uh, the uh, so-called Asian steppes, you know, coming from Iran and other places, the Aryan people that, that came and they, and they, and when they came over, they took over a system that was already in place. Every um, culture or civilization has a quote unquote caste system. You you have a you have a priestly class, you have a um, a merchant class, you have a soldier class, you have the people that you know do the farming and 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 that's what the caste system is. But when the Aryans came in, they um, uh, you know localized it to the people that they were conquer that they conquered, and so the sudras and the Dalits, which uh, we also know as untouchables, those people were on the bottom, you know, and so they, they, were, they were permanently on the bottom. And if you read any, and I'm sure you're probably aware, uh, uh, Minister Ahmadi, uh, uh, Renoko Rashidi and, and Wayne Chandler's in their um, Af African presence in early Asia, they talk about the, the Dalits and even today, there are over 100 million Dalits and uh, to, to a, uh, some extent, they are under the, the issues that were going back maybe 1500 years ago. Some are living in remote places where they have to tie uh, brooms around their waist so, it, so when they walk, they won't leave their footprints and, and they, they have to eat out of broken um, uh, uh, utensils and, 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 and so many other things that, that they have to overcome. But they identify with uh, black people in America because when Jesse Jackson ran for president, in their publications, they said a Dalit is running <laughs> for president in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. Uh, you Thank know, you. that's something that I always think about, but things were, some things were in place and they were good and they remained the same and then others were imposed upon them. Okay. Uh, I have a question, Minister Imhotep. Sure. Um, I, I think part of this might have gotten uh, answered while I was uh, stepped away to deal with the phone piece, but since it's kind of coming back, I want to ask it again. Um, I'm just trying to understand the relationship. Uh, well, I've heard of comedic yoga. Yes. But when we do meditation, I'm generally thinking of uh, an Eastern uh, meditation. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but it has been said to me, why are you doing this Eastern meditation and you're representing a comedic uh, place of worship? So can you guys uh, do something to square that up with me? Why am I studying yogis instead of... Uh, someone in, in Kemet, in, in most cases, when I ask these questions on most general topics, the answer comes back to, it was something that was taken from Africa and re, you know, reintroduced somewhere else and then brought back to us as something new. Um, so that's the story I've told myself in my head, but I have no facts to back that up. Could you all help me? Kofi, do you want to start on that first? Well, um, none of you want to start with facts. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's provable. Um, when I when I started this this whole discussion, I said that um, the deeper we go into our minds, the darker it becomes. But also, I said that uh, if the Wright brothers were Catholic, does that mean only Catholics can ride the plane? It doesn't matter where the knowledge came from. Knowledge is knowledge. Truth is truth. And um, this, 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 these superficial divisions, they disappear when you're getting 
closer and closer to um, that infinite being. So to me, wherever truth comes from, it, if it's a bomb on the street, truth is truth. And a lot of this stuff uh, is not truth, and that's what falls away. And that, that just varies from place to place in belief to belief. But why, why worry about where it came from if it is real? Bulia, you want to tackle that, that question? Uh, you're one of the wisest on this uh, program now. Yeah? I'd say the. The, yes. You're on, uh, nope. You don't know how to cut off the mute, un, unmute first. <laughs> okay. I, uh, this, uh, I've known Kofi for quite a while. I've observed him with a, having a very inquisitive mind. Anything that he found that he needed, he would search for it and assess it and its worth to him as he deepened his knowledge about himself and the things around him. So I, I, I wonder, Kofi, if you would share um, some aspect of how you began that journey uh, and particularly the part of being in the Bay Area, how it deepened your uh, self-knowledge as well as your ongoing inquisitiveness about the knowledge our people needed in order to progress. Excuse Even though we were in the United States under this kind of subjugated circumstances. Excuse mm -hmm. me, excuse me, Abuya. I, I was just hoping that, uh, I don't know if you heard uh, Liz's question and it, and it had to do with, um, you know, uh, Indian East Eastern uh, meditation uh, versus uh, African meditation. Why don't we do um, more of the African meditation or Kemet meditation? And why do we rely on so much the Eastern um, uh, meditation that that was that was a question i was hoping you could address yeah well i so i'll hold i'll hold that in advance i for me i think that this is uh i start with the fact that a a a, a uh an opening to my wisdom and knowledge began when i realized that the original people were us and so then I, by taking that as a way of grounding myself in all the other studies that I was doing as an undergraduate and graduate, that was the most profound insight for me that no longer while any of the classes that I took would I be uh, marinated in the European perspective as if they were the original carriers of the knowledge when we as a people were. So for me, the journey began as soon as I became conscious of that. And then therefore the live being in the library took a different path. It, it made me take a different path. I wasn't going to read all the material that was uh, European driven or white driven. So that library had all of the material that represented us as a people. And so that was, that was the beginning of me. I'm, and Kofi and I met through Transcendental Meditation. I mean, I think that was part of our beginning. And even that learning then led to understand how we as a people had an ongoing scientific method, cultural method of staying in touch with something that was greater than ourselves. And I, I can't, I, I could just say, that's what really let me graduate from Berkeley. <laughs> Live person. Because then I could, you know, the BS that I was getting about in classes, all of my papers and research started with that premise mm -hmm. that we were the original people. 
I didn't always get the grades that I thought I should get, but it didn't matter anymore. You know, and so that's, I'm just sitting here thinking about that experience that it was a clear eye opening for me as an intellectual piece, but more deeply as a spiritual piece. And that just gave me a tremendous uh, energy and insight about things that could be accomplished by our people in the present time, because they had already set the stage by the accomplishments that they had put forth on the earth, you know, many, many centuries ago. And, and that, that answer, that answer kind of, uh, le it, it kind of encompasses what I said is my assumption that most things started with us because we were the first to start pretty much everything. And sometimes we get reintroduced to ourselves and told that it's something new. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sounds a little bit, um, a little bit like maybe that's what you are saying too. But again, you know, my, my more simple question is even if that's the case, like why is it that this knowledge would have left Africa and then ingrained itself so strongly, you know, Northeast of uh, Africa and, and it not be common knowledge. And I'm, you know, by far no expert, but I just rarely hear about really meditation from a African's perspective. And even when I was introduced with comedic uh, meditation in just recent years, you know, my response was kind of to raise my eyebrow and say, oh, well, what do you mean comedic yoga? You know, that's, that's the realm of the yogis, you know? Um, well, can I, can I just, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna to try to answer your question. And then Kofi, I want you, uh, after I answer this, Kofi, I want you to talk about what you're doing now at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, as we're rounding out, we've got about uh, seven minutes left in the class. But in uh, Stolen Legacy, uh, Naja, there is a, a, a section that talks about the uh, various uh, schools. And the Grand Lodge is, uh, you know, Dr. Williams, Dr. Chancellor, excuse me, Dr. George Jim James is saying the Grand Lodge is at Luxor. Or, uh, or which is really Wasat or Wose. And then there were subordinate lodges. And then he names them. You know, the, the lodges were in, in South America. The lodges were in um, India. They, they were in Medina. They were in, you, you know, all of these various places that, uh, that now remain uh, holy uh, places or places of knowledge. They, they originate in, uh, in Kemet, and then they spread throughout the world. Now, there are still meditation and still heavy masters on the African continent uh, to this day. And uh, I would like to share something with you offline uh, that you can look at that, it, that actually is, is coming from um, South Africa and their connection to uh, the fourth dynastic uh, per a uh, Khufu. Okay, so uh, let, let's uh, take, take your question offline. It's a very deep and uh, a, a very encompassing question, and I'm glad that you asked it, and it, it's something that I've been wrestling with personally myself. Kofi, can you just uh, kind of round out the program with what you're doing uh, at, at the Morehouse School of Medicine? Okay. Um... If you, if you ask anybody at Morehouse, they couldn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> now, somebody knows, though. Somebody knows a piece of it. But they, haven't put it they, they haven't put it all together yet. Um, uh, what My title is an assistant professor, and I've been that for a long time. And I um, probably, probably if I was, if I felt that that was one of the reasons I was here, I would, I would do more in, in that line. But I generally do what I want to do at the university, as long as I can pay for it through grants or, you know, whatever, you know, partner with somebody. But my area um, of focus is meditation, mind-body medicine. 
there is an elective called Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and I teach there. Um, and I teach meditation and talk about the physiology of it and the research you know, associated with it. I teach in a community health course, which um, takes our first year medical students uh, out into the community and work with um, uh, individuals in the community. Uh, the, the facility that I take uh, 12 students to uh, for two semesters is uh, it's called City of Refuge. It's a homeless shelter for women and children. So we do projects to help them. And at the same time, we help students uh, interact with them more because they're going to be physicians and they're going to run into people that maybe not have a home or, you know, maybe have other issues. So they have to learn how to deal with that uh, in a culturally appropriate way. Um, I also uh, work with the Office of Global Health Equity, which is our newly formed Office of Global Health that uh, we work with sending students out to different countries, or we used to. Um, uh, now everybody's on hold. Uh, but every year we would send people out, maybe about 20 students out for uh, up to three months and learn, do research, interact with the people in, from different cultures. I direct a Fogarty program, which also does the same thing, but it's for 11 months working overseas with the stipend and research money uh, mentor, all of that stuff is, is part of that, uh, that program. Uh, I do work with uh, traditional medicine. Um, we've been looking at some herbs from Senegal uh, for uh, over 10 years, um, doing some work, looking at its effects on HIV, as well as um, we've even, um, uh, we have some of the sample of the herbs going to a uh, location that can um, look at the coronavirus because they're all viruses. HIV is a virus, Ebola is a virus, Corona is a virus. And so if there's a group of herbs that can interact with viruses in general and has sp specific mitigation uh, effects on the virus and it's natural, that's a good thing. So uh, I've been working on that. Um, uh, so those are kind of the things that I do, but you know, if I see something that comes up that attracts my attention, I figure out a way to work on it. Kofi, I, I just got a question here. It says, can uh, you uh, talk about your views on uh, the coronavirus? Uh, do, is there anything that you'd like to uh, uh, elaborate on that? Well, I, I believe they're intentionally killing us, uh, the humans, not the virus. Um, but I think the people aren't caring about overexposure or children being exposed. They're, they're, they are trying to get rid of us. And um, they've released this in, in the air somehow, um, which is suspect to me how it, how it got loose. Um, but I think we, we, if we can't stop it, if we can't get somebody in there that's going to take a country view of the problem and make some decisions, we're going to be in trouble for a long time. I agree. I agree. Any, any other questions uh, as we're getting ready to wind down? I think we have one minute left. Uh, maybe we'll uh, get a little uh, extra time. Uh, any other questions? I'm glad, I'm glad that you all could attend. I see, I see Brother Katabasi, and I see uh, Sister Mona, and I see uh, Malik and Bobby. Uh, Booyah. Uh, that's all I can see on my screen right now, but uh, I know I know that there are more. And uh, I saw something on the chat, Kofi, just uh, someone had written. I don't know if you got a chance to look at it. No, I haven't been looking at it. Okay, of course not. Uh, but it was, <laughs> it was someone that wrote uh, from, from Melanie Moore. Oh, I know her. Yes, I, f I figured you did. Thank you for allowing me to sit in the discussion. Dr. Kofi is my big brother and I always impressed with his travels and knowledge. Love you, big bro. So I just <laughs> thought, I thought you should hear that. All right. A any other uh, questions or comments? Um, I it, it seems as if we need to investigate African meditation. That seems to be one of the things that people are, are concerned with. Um, but as uh, this is my personal feeling, uh, as uh, has been elucidated by uh, 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 Dr. Mack, Dr. Carl Mack, which we, uh, his African name is Abuya, and uh, Dr. Kofi, 
um, the root of meditation is is within yourself, and uh, there, there there are various vehicles that remain to achieve oneness with God. So, if you study the mystical part of of Christianity, that's a vehicle. If you study the mystical part of Islam, that is a vehicle. If you study the mystical part of Ifa or any other African religion, that is uh, the root of it is, is, is going within. And as I explained earlier, there are people that still do the miraculous things that we read about and hear about in India. There are people in Africa that's, that are still able to do those things. And it's just, they don't just, they don't come out, uh, you, you know, in, in public a lot of times. A lot of times it's still a secret society. It's still uh, uh, various initiations that you have to go through in order to achieve those things. And uh, sometimes they're not as readily available as uh, in other, as coming from other places. So. That's just my little thing on that. Uh, looks like Mama Fanya is there. Is that right? Did I see you just shaking your head there? No, that's Mona. All right. So I have a closing, uh, I have a closing thought. Emma, yeah. before uh -huh. you guys close out real quick, so is, is he saying that the virus is man-made? Do you believe the coronavirus is man-made? I believe it could be. Uh. I think the jury's still out on that. If it's sitting in the lab, you know, why are they saying it came out of a lab? You know, that means they were fooling with it. Yeah. In China, do you think it started in China? Yeah, yeah. I think I think. Well, I, you, you know, on on that, uh, Naja, uh, there is a video of an of the president of Ghana saying that, and, and you know, again, this is not substantiated. This is not the gospel, but this is a video of the president of Ghana saying, "This was created in the United States." by the Rockefeller uh, uh, Foundation, and it was taken to China so that the Chinese would be blamed for it. Yeah. Also, I'm, somebody just put this, 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 this is very interesting to me, Madagascar. So there, uh, there's uh, allegedly a cure for corona in Madagascar, of which the president of Madagascar is talking about it, and you can and you can search. There's there's YouTube videos, and there are other uh, uh, items that that mention that. Now, of course, yesterday um, there was a sister from the Cameroon who, who who graduated medical school in Nigeria, and is talking about you know uh, I can never pronounce that word. Stella, uh, huh? You talking about Stella, that lady who? Yes, Dr. Stella Emmanuel. Uh, which, okay, that's been proven, that's been disproven, that's been debunked. And so, the, you, you know, the, my, from my standpoint on that is that we are never told the truth, we're never told the truth about, about the Tuskegee experiment, we're never told the truth about how AIDS got into the world, we're never told the truth about Ebola, and, and all of these other things, there's a book called A Higher, For a Higher Form of Killing, uh, of which 360 biological uh, experiments and, and uh, agents have been put out. You know, it's chronicled and listed. So, you, you know, their history is against them. You know, and so, so we are, we are uh, justified from, uh, you, you know, from having uh, 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 reservations, for having reservations about anything that is the official story. And I have a, I personally have a problem with you telling me that some people in China eating bats is, is, is the way that this thing got disseminated. That just sounds funny to me right there. They've been eating bats, you know? So, so uh, anyway, um, I'm sorry. I didn't come here to preach to you today. All right. <laughs> Them more, you better get back in the matrix. They're going to come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, I'd like week. a parting thought, uh, M. Hotel. Yes, go ahead, brother. I do a parting thought. I say parting thoughts. And that is 
no matter what thoughts you have about anything, park them and you will find silence. And it's that silence that will take you to the source of yourself. Uh, but you have to part the thoughts, no matter what they are. You let them go and you go in deeper where there's no language, there's no divisions, there's nothing. That's, that's where you wanna hang out. You wanna work from there rather than, than have all these preconceptions and ideas and try to get there through a thought or an idea. You don't get there through ideals and thoughts. You get there by no ideas and no thoughts. And, and that's where the power is. And that's why I dedicated my life to helping people get to that. Because once people can get there, I'm done with them and I can go on to the, to the next person. So I, I think the thoughts are good and useful, but they're not the real deal. Right, man, I really appreciate you joining us, taking the time and uh, uh, sharing uh, different parts of your life with us. Next week, we have Mama Darnisha, and she's going to talk about her 30-day excursion to Ghana. And mm -hmm. I know there's, there's people that's, that's uh, with us and people that will be joining us that have actually visited Ghana. Co Kofi, we didn't get a chance to talk about your visits uh, to Ghana, uh, but... Um, uh, would, would it be all right if I share your uh, contact information with people if they wanted to get in contact with you, okay, uh, later on because you can't cover everything in an hour and a half. Uh, so it's 637. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for your questions and uh, glad you could be with us and hope to see you next week. Uh, Mama Darnisha is on the 5th and then Sister Katrina of KemetNews.com will be with us on the 12th. All right, take care. And then Ankh Ujab Saneb, life, prosperity, and health, live up. Live up.